Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to present a bit our work and what we are doing. And thanks a lot also for the organization team for like all the support and the organization was really well made. Um, I wanted to discuss a bit, uh, bringing a bit, um, what are the development in genomics that you can take in your everyday life and also in like your research projects. Um, here really it's about how how could we get better in genomics um, in the whole sciences? Um, so I'm coming from a university of Tübingen. It's in the south of Germany. Um, I'm French, obviously, so my accent is not German at all. Um, my institute is a uh, human genetics. It's one of the biggest human genetics in Germany, actually. We have um, more than 150 coworkers. We are running like more than 2,000 um, patients, um, discussions, and we perform roughly like 7,000 analyses per year. Our focus is on rare disease, which I think in neuroscience is quite important. There is a lot of rare disease in, in the sector of like brain disorders, but also like neurology in general. Um, we have a strong focus in oncology as well as uh, neurosciences as a whole. Uh, here, importantly, human genetics is really important for rare disease, as they are just so difficult to diagnose, and we discuss about that a bit afterwards. Um, I'm working into what we call a core facility, um, a competence center, actually. And there, my aim is to promote development of genomic tools. Um, we develop DNA solutions as well as RNA solutions. And in order to help the scientists to develop new methods and find the unfindable, we develop technologies such as long read sequencing or epigenomics. I guess these are words which are very, at the moment, uh, fashion. So you can see them a lot around it. I'm not going to discuss too much about epigenomics or single cell sequencing, but I will introduce long read in the talk. So why do we use genomics to diagnose disease in rare disease? Well, I mean, rare disease is really tough because many patients might have very close symptoms. However, the cause of the symptoms could be very, very different. And in the context of rare disease with more than 5,000 rare disease, which are at the moment annotated, is getting really more and more difficult to make sure that it's a symptom and not another. Um, at the moment, um, what is very convenient is to accompany the patients through an assessment of their phenotypes, um, look also a tiny bit in their history, and decide whether a genetic test would help to conclude what might be the disorders. Uh, for this family, it's very difficult. Usually, a lot of these diseases are very penetrant and also very handicapping. And having a clear name on the disease as well as an idea how this disease will develop and what could help them is extremely important for the families. So usually what will happen is a geneticist will look at the case, will decide whether a genomic test will help or not. And then there are a couple of selection of tests which would be done. One of the tests which is heard a lot into genetics is this whole exome sequencing as well as whole genome sequencing. Uh, all exome sequencing is basically only sequencing the part of the genome which code for proteins. This is like one to two percent of the genomes. This is relatively cheap to do. The organization of the data is not that complicated. It's also relatively powerful, but of course, sequencing the whole genome is the most performant way of doing this. Um, what is also important is to decide like is the phenotype de novo? Is it already in the family? So in the case, we have a de novo mutation, which means that, they, that the parents don't have the mutation. It's only like the child who has the mutation and who has the disease. Then it's important to sequence both of the parents in order to detect the new mutation, which could lead to the disease. And there, depending on if we need to do trio or not, depending on how fast we need to make the experiment, and also depending which category of disease it is and what is the affordability, one would decide between exome sequencing or genome sequencing. An important part of this workflow is the variant management. Here, the variant management is basically how to look at the data we generated in order to find what could be the cause of the disease. This is one thing which might look complicated for an ungeneticist. However, nowadays, with the software we are doing and with all the database annotation which exists, and this is getting faster and simpler to do. 
However, here what is very important is to only call variants which are reliable, meaning it's already shown that this specific genetic mutation really leads to a disease. And also that the mutation could lead to different clinical guidance. It's very important to well data bank what um, are the mutation funded and what do they do to, to the disease. Um, very importantly, in genomics are the best practices, so we want to be accurate and we want to be reproducible. That's why the informatics pipeline, the way we are analyzing the data from genomics are very important, and that's why also we need to have good reference standards in the clinic. And finally, something I'm going to discuss briefly is like the return of testing. It's important to diagnose disease by genomics, not only because it allows us to be more safe about the diagnostic we do and the follow-up of the patients, but also because the more genomic tests we do, the more performant we are at, you know, not only um, making health records, which are helpful for, um, for the physicians, but also developing intelligent art artificial intelligence and also improving genetic counseling for this kind of disease. Here I show briefly a study we did in the context of Solvardi. I will go into that in a bit more detail, but you see on the top left that Testing one single gene is like the less powerful method you could do and testing the whole genome is the most powerful tool you could use. And when we use exome sequencing in patients with rare disease, we find roughly that 50% of the case could be solved. That could vary between 20 to 80%, depending on exactly the kind of disease. And um, here in our study, we had roughly 10,000 patients, 4,400 were unsolved. So what we made is we made like the strategy one, let's try to reanalyze the data that we had with just better tools and using different tools from different universities. And out of this 4,400, which went through this pipeline, roughly 60% of them did not find a gene candidate, meaning we did a new world to look in detail and we could not analyze further what might be the cause of the disease. In 40% of the case, we could find a candidate, meaning a gene that could explain the disease usually 1.45 gene variant per cases, which is something realistic to look into more details. And there we basically ask specialists of the disease if they would be interested to validate um, the data and the variant that we found, like new variants which were never reported in a population. And out of them, roughly 30% got picked by specialists and 120 were served. The 25 stay under validation some were heterogeneous uh, variants, meaning that they, they could not really explain the full phenotypes and 330 stay unsolved. So on the small diagram on the bottom, what you can see is that depending on the disease, for example, intellectual disability, intellectual disability, they could be still well solved by this kind of pipeline, but other diseases, for example, like tumor risk syndrome, they are still very difficult to diagnose genetically. Another strategy that we can do in order to better diagnose disease and have more cases which are solved by genetics is what we call sharing data via patient matching request. I think it's, it's a very interesting strategy and I think it's also for scientific work really important. Um, in our consortium, which is called RD Connect, so it's a rare disease connect. Um, it's a portal which basically allow medical professionals to share experience and data from specific cases which could help other specialists in their field. Here, what is very handy on this portal is when a genetician finds a disease um, in a family and he has a very good gene candidate, but the variant is unknown, he can ask into the network via automatic requests who would have family of patients with mutation on this specific gene, which could explain the phenotypes in this specific case. On the portal, you could see that the participant ID would be the name of the clinicians. And you see that he's, he's searching for a gene matcher for a sporadic disease at the neonatal stage for the candidate gene CHRND. Um, so this is very important because when like cluster of uh, geneticians find a gene which is mutated on a specific disease, they can collaborate together to also do functional testing. And the last strategy I wanted to show is, uh, of course, one way to solve more cases is just to do more research and to also get what we call more expanded genetic events. Here I showed basically well, the difference between like the classical NGS, like next generation sequencing, and like the new technology of sequencing, which is called long read sequencing. 
the main difference between the two methods is that the sequence of DNA, which could be exactly detected by the instrument, is much longer, so a range of like 10 to 100 times longer. And this basically helps us to solve the puzzle of genetics. So using long read sequencing, one could find new mutation which could not be found before. One thing very easy to understand is, for example, structural variation. If a gene is inverted into the genomes, it's very difficult to find the exact reads at the border of the gene, which would explain that the gene was inverted. And similarly, if a gene is moved through the genomes, it's also very difficult to find what we call breakpoint, where the genome was destroyed and where basically the gene was moved. This is much easier to do with long read sequencing. Another example, which is very relevant for um, neurodegenerative disorders, but also for epilepsy, are like repeat expansion. So genomic area can have like uh, small repeats of, for example, three nucleotides, five nucleotides, or like more complicated structures. And because these structures are typically in the range of like a couple of hundred base pair, they cannot be detected with usual sequencing. However, with long read sequencing, we can span the so whole repeats in one read and really detect in more detail in the patients if there are some repeat expansion available. I don't want to go too much in detail because I know that the audience is not like a genetic audience, but phasing is also something which is quite interesting, meaning if there is a SNP on the mother or on the father, um, it might be that um, the, the phenotype will be different than if the both uh, mutation are on one allele. These are like cumulative SNPs, which might play an important role into the gene function. And finally, pseudogenes can play a very important role in disease, but they are difficult to figure out. Basically, pseudogenes are genes which are different, but which have a very similar structures. And using this very short read of DNA, it's difficult to figure out if we are in a gene or in a pseudogene. However, with long read sequencing, we have enough information to identify which exact gene are we on. So with everything said, and this is what um, is the focus of our labs. The, focu the focus of our labs is to resolve complex rearrangement into genomes. Um, our strategy um, is summarized into um, the paper I put it there, and the idea is very easy. The idea is that genomes is a lot of information, and putting all the genomic information together to find modification of the structure of the genome is almost impossible on the normal computer clusters. However, with smart design and with good algorithms, this is still possible to do it in high throughput for a large amount of patients. The strategy we use is we use uh, NGS, short read sequencing, where basically instead of having a genomic region of interest with a read one and a read two pointing toward each other, with like an insert of three to 600 base pair. There is some anomaly in this read, for example, instead of putting one to the other, they are like inverted, which seems to mean that there is an inversion in the genome opening. Or what we call a translocation, a specific read it is on a chromosome, and another read is on another chromosome. That means that two chromosomes got reassembled. Or a deletion between two specific reads. There is a much longer genomic region than anticipated. So when this is detected on short read sequencing, we can do then long read sequencing and try to validate the events. Um, this could be done looking at this kind of uh, issue. But that could be also done looking at how we discover specific genomic region. And with our algorithm, the idea is to find the exact breakpoint where is the genome broken. And this algorithm works very well. So here in this example, we use a cell line with a lot of genomic events, so more than 800 of them. And what we could detect in this cell line is that using our pipelines, this, this kind of calculation could be done in a couple of hours. And all the single events could be uh, validated using different technologies. So these methods are very powerful. They run very well on limited hardware. Um, they can be run with very large uh, cohort of patients, like several thousand of patients in a reasonable amount of time. And they are also very robust. Now going to the RNA topic, um, the problem of this structural variant is we don't always know what they do in the genome. One could see that the genome is broken, but if that would lead to a phenotype or not is another, um, is another problem. So typically what we propose at the moment in, in our institutes is patients who come for consulting, genomic consulting, um, will give blood for DNA isolation and for RNA isolation. 
And this is for us a very powerful strategy because we can get from one visit and DNA and RNA, and we develop method for storage of DNA and RNA in order to process the sample stepwise. Importantly, what we learned from research is this kind of test need to be done in, with a very specific quality and with a very specific reproducibility. And this is very difficult to reach uh, without uh, lab, uh, lab automation. And therefore, at the moment, what we do is we automatize RNA, uh, RNA isolation on the platform and we automatize the generation of a library for sequencing on the second platform. And that allows us to perform a couple of hundred of samples within a few days with very low variability independent of the user, as well as a relatively simple protocol with reduced cost. Um, one of the first methods that we established um, in our pipeline was the validation that variants of coding region. And this really matters because not all the mutations are all annotated. That means that, for example, if we take a blood sample with 25,000 genes which are expressed, we can commonly detect, detect 15,000 of them, so almost like more than half of them. And if we find, for example, a variant which is not known in the database, but which have a function which is common to another mutation, for example, a mutation on a critical domain, on a regulatory domain, and so on, uh, we could test at the RNA level that it's not a um, loss of expression, that it's really a change of the RNA and of the protein. So this power a lot our analysis, especially in rare disease where a lot of variants are still not annotated and where it's difficult to make a diagnostic. Something else that we do that I think is also relatively easy to understand is um, we also test with the RNA if the splicing of the RNA is correct. Um, in a normal case, for example, we would have um, three exomes. There is an exome gray, purple, and gray, and the splicing can be with or without these specific exomes. However, what could happen is due to mutation in, for example, deep intronic regions, it might be that the splicing does not happen anymore. So a new exon is spliced in, an intron is retained, or an alternative splice site would happen. And again, these mutations are usually not annotated in database. And if we find them in whole genome sequencing, we can look directly in the RNA sequencing to see whether this mutation that we found is, they might play an important role into this protein or not. So that's basically allow us to speed up um, the genomic testing by building hypotheses and testing immediately with RNA-C whether this hypothesis are correct or not. And for us, what is really important is we manage to integrate this analysis into, um, into a tool which allow us to test is there on a gene specific deletion insertion which could break the splicing and on top a filter which allow us to detect automatically whether splicing was indeed changed into this specific gene. So that simplifies a lot the work of the analyst. Um, something I wanted to discuss very briefly is the um, issue of gene expression. The problem of gene expression with RNA-seq is um, that the gene expression is not stable in individuals through the time. That means that it's very difficult to generate a database of blood where we can identify very easily what we call outlier, meaning genes which are supposed to be expressed, which are not expressed, and vice versa, which are not supposed to be expressed, but are not expressed. And there are many algorithms which are available in order to, to, to do that, but here what is critical is the metadata uh, of, the, of the patient. So here a warning, I think, at the moment, gene expression analysis of blood in large cohorts, which are not aimed to be compared, is still technically challenging. And the final application I wanted to bring also because, um, as I mentioned, we do quite a bit of oncology. Um, RNA-seq allows to also detect fusion genes. That means that if there is a large deletion in the genes, and we expect that, for example, um, two genes will be fused into one specific uh, messenger RNA, RNA sequencing can help us to figure out whether these specific genes was fused with this one. And this also save a lot of time when we do diagnostic to directly validate that this fusion gene exists or not. 
Um, a very short example of a study that we made is we found in a family of patients a stop loss variant. That means that the stop codon of a specific gene was lost. And we wanted to detect at the RNA level whether there is a non mediated decay, which is reported in this case to don't release to a phenotypes, or whether the stop loss is indeed leading to an expanded protein, which leads to a disease. As the mutation was not known, it was not clear for us if a mediated decay will occur or not. So we took a fibroblast from these patients, not blood in this case, because blood was not expressing CLDN11. And by sequencing the RNA of an individual versus a control, we detected the mutation by the RO here. And basically we could validate that uh, the protein is express expanded and leads to the specific phenotypes. So my take home message is um, if you have course of patients where you would like to make genomic um, tests, collect blood for DNA, but also collect blood for RNA, this will save um, time into your study, especially because you can store this tube for long term, you don't have to analyze them immediately. And um, that will really boost up uh, your yield of uh, diagnostics. Um, one application which is easy is aberrant splicing. This is something which could be done uh, relatively easily. And the loss of heterozygote, um, the loss of heterozygosity is also something which is relatively easy to uh, test. However, um, the analyses which are based on gene dysregulation, they require a very large data background. They also require a lot of metadata of the patient. Um, we'd like to acknowledge the team of uh, Professor Ries in the institute where I'm working, as well as all the scientists and technicians who are involved in these projects. And thank you for the opportunity to present in our research.